Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Be Healthistic. As you can see behind me, this is not my uh, traditional place where I record podcasts. I'm actually traveling in an Airstream right now. So if the internet connection is not that great at times, my apologies. Uh, today on the show, my dad and I are welcoming Dr. Joel Furman, a board certified family physician, New York Times bestselling author, and an internationally recognized expert on nutrition and natural healing. He coined the term Nutritarian to describe a nutrient-dense eating style designed to prevent cancer, slow aging, and extend lifespan, which we're going to talk more about today. We're also going to discuss how it's possible to prevent heart disease, diabetes, and many other illnesses, and also achieve sustainable weight loss using smart nutrition. Welcome to Be Healthistic, the podcast that's more than just health and wellness information, it's here to help you explore your options across traditional and natural medicine so that you can make informed decisions for you and your family. This podcast illuminates the whole story about holistic health by providing access to the expertise of doctors Steve and Drew Sinatra, who together have decades of integrative health experience. Be Healthistic is powered by our friends at Healthy Directions. Now, let's join our hosts. Hi, folks. If you like what you hear today and you want to listen to future conversations on all things integrative and holistic health, subscribe to our podcast at BeHealthisticPodcast.com. Also, check out and subscribe to the Healthy Directions YouTube channel, which features video versions of our episodes plus extra videos you won't want to miss. And finally, we have more with me, Dr. Drew Sinatra, my dad, Dr. Steve Sinatra, and other health experts at HealthyDirections.com. So we'll jump right in, Dr. Furman. Um, I'm curious, as a family physician, how did you get involved in all this work with nutrition? Well, I um, got involved with nutrition when I was a competitive figure skater in the 1970s, and um, through my family and through my own athletic career. And I actually decided to go to medical school because of my interest in nutrition. I was having this conversation with this woman at, a, at my sister's graduation party from college. And I was, and she was telling me how she was going to go to medical school. And I was thinking of it in the back of my mind, you know, thinking of taking some courses. But I already had graduated from college and didn't have the prerequisites. And then this woman said, "Well, if you're so," and I said, "What do you want to be a doctor for? They just give people toxic stuff for, to deal with all the crap they eat. And it's you know, it's just like hitting yourself with a hammer every day. And you go to a doctor, and he tells you to gives you pain medication. You come back home and you whack yourself with a hammer again in the same spot. I said, "It's like it's it's totally wasteful for what most doctors do." And she said, well, if you're so passionate about it, why don't you go back to medical school and, and um, you know, be a doctor and change things? And I said, well, I thought about that, but I, didn't, you know, I, I don't have any of the prerequisites. I'm already you know, in my career. I'm, you know, I graduated from college. And she said, well, if you... So anyway, so I did. I dropped everything. I sold my family's shoe business that I was running. And I went back to the postgraduate pre-med program at Columbia specifically to get to be a physician specializing in nutrition. And I wanted to be a family doctor so I could then do nutrition on all types of ages and peoples. Um, and, and of course, eventually that woman became my wife, Lisa. Oh, okay. And I'm, I'm curious though, I mean, in, in med school, you probably didn't learn that much about nutrition. You probably learned everything about nutrition outside of medical school, correct? Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Matter of fact, they made me chairperson of the Nutrition Education Committee at University of Pennsylvania. It was funny because I would actually be having these meetings and, and I'd be walking to my seat, you know, in like the stadium seating and, and the other students. And, we, you know, they're older people, but like in their 20s and things. But, and they would be hiding their candy bars or their, their pretzels behind their backs and stuff like that. And I'd say, I'm not your mother. You know, you don't have to hide it from me. <laughs> so, so, Dr. Furman, you did a residency as well, right? I mean, um, I did a family practice residency. That's correct. So what was that? Three years? Of yes. postgraduate training? That's correct. Three so years what was it like, you know, being in that training where um, I guess sometimes nutrition was beneficial and, and sometimes it was non-existent, I mean, you know, when you're doing surgery and stuff like that? Yes, I did. I did a lot of surgeries and things. Um, but, yeah, the training was more like prison, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I equated it with I equated call with and residency with getting out of prison. You'd count, you'd mark off the days in the calendar when you'd be done. You know, I'm going to be released from prison. You know, it's like <laughs> no, it's 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 no doubt about it. I mean, uh, I mean now today, I think I think society is more humane in the training of a physician as it, as it was years ago. So yes, for sure. Good. 
Well, true. I have a big interest in diabetes. And I'll tell you why, Joel. My my mother and grandmother both had diabetes. Really? And uh, and they both went blind. It's kind of interesting uh, that they they met the same demise. And, uh, you know, I'm a big CoQ10 user. I've been using it for for decades. And uh, um, my mother was riddled with glaucoma and retinopathy. And then I uh, came across an article about coenzyme Q10 being utilized in glaucoma today. And and uh, and and also protecting the retina, you know, from um, uh, from degeneration, and um, you know, in my growth and development, you, you know, I always feared, you know, getting diabetes because it, genetically it's on my side. But then mm-hmm. when I became, you know, endowed with CoQ10, and I and I've been using it for decades, and my family members were using it as well, you know, my sisters and my brother. And none of us have developed high hemoglobin A1Cs. And I'm wondering, do you, do you think, you know, being a diabetic expert, uh, you think CoQ10 might have made a difference in, um, in delaying, you know, the, the possibility of insulin resistance or even, um, you know, frank diabetes as well? Well, it depends on the other um, risks and the other ha- habits, lifestyle habits that could have overwhelmed that beneficial effect. If you were going to be obese and eat a lot of, you know, greasy food, fried food, you know, high glycemic carbohydrates. But in other words, if your diet was poor, as you, you can't negate the effect of obesity. And as right. people get heavy, your fat cells spew out lipokines and cytokines, and they make you insulin resistant, and they destroy your um, your aromatase. They produce extra estrogen, produce your horm- throw off your hormones, and they. In other words, what I'm saying is that when your weight is relatively stable and you have a few extra pounds to lose, maybe that could play a role, but it, but it, it couldn't overwhelm the overall negative effects of o- being overweight. So I've I've did a um. A lot of people with macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy that reversed it completely. Even the Shea Eye Institute at University of Pennsylvania had a lot of my patients who had to cancel their surgeries and, and were shocked. They even submitted a grant, of a ten, I think it was a, a $1.5 million grant to the national, to the NIH to, get, um, to do a study on the nutritarian approach. But we were using to reverse the diabetic retinopathy in the, in the macular degeneration, which actually reversed, not just prevented it. They had, these people were diabetic and they had it. Their diabetes went away and their diabetic retinopathy and their macular degeneration went away at the same time. And of course, we're, you know, a nutritarian diet uses moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence, eating a lot of vegetable, you know, greens and beans and onions and mushrooms. And then they're, of course, we're giving them, if they have um, macular degeneration, we're giving them some juices of um, half, one third, one third, one third, one third of a green like lettuce, celery, cucumber, one third um, carrot, beet, and one third cruciferous, mostly bok choy. So we're trying to flood them because with the amount of the carotenoids that are great for the um, back of the eye in the juices could be, um, you know, 20 times as much as those rad supplements ophthalmologists give their patients, you know, with the carotenoids. And you absorb them better. They work more effectively when you're getting them from food and juices in the natural state than just taking one or two in a supplement because you get hundreds of them that work synergistically when you take the in the in the whole um, dietary program. So I've had a, a tremendous success in not just preventing diabetes, but reversing diabetes and reversing the eye damage from diabetes, you know. So that's incredible. I mean that's I mean, Drew, I mean our listeners can take that one to the bank. I mean our eyes are precious and to reverse a retinopathy situation, you know, right. with juicing and and specifically in bok choy, I'm kind of interested in what what's the ingredient in bok choy that uh, makes a difference? It's the ITCs, the isothiocyanates, right, mm-hmm. that, that have the effect to activate the NRF2 transcription protein. Right. And you know that when you get these diseases, it's a buildup of reactive oxygen species and, and, and advanced glycation end products. So it's the AGEs that build up in, in an inflammatory environment. So you're combining the nutrients, you know, obviously with a loss of body weight. And what I'm saying here is quite... Um, radical to degree. I'm saying that even when a person has like lap band or gastric bypass, you can measure their inflammatory markers, their insulin resistance, their diabetic parameters, their aroma, you can measure that, you know, and these things go start to get better before they lose all their weight, as long as they're dropping at least a kilogram a week. 
a kilogram. So this is what we've said the same, we see the same thing, whether we're measuring inflammatory markers or, um, or insulin levels or whatever, whatever we're measuring the abnormalities, the myoperoxidase or oxidized LDL, we're seeing that people sure get better when they've reached an ideal weight with a body fat below 15% for a male and below 25% for a female to optimize. But we see tremendous improvement, even resolution, before they lose all their weight, as long as they're dropping the weight at least a kilogram a week. If they lose weight and then stable it at an over, and it's still overweight, you start to see the inflammation starts to go up again. But if they're continuing to lose weight and heading towards that ideal weight, as long as they keep on the program, we see dramatic improvement in the metabolic markers before they've lost all their weight even. You follow me? Right. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and you know, losing a kilogram a week is, I mean, that's, that's really healthy weight loss. There's, there's no doubt about it. That's nice, slow weight loss, which I, which I, I really endorse as well. And, yeah. and Dad, like this, this is really the approach that I think a lot of people are missing out on is this retreat center approach, really, that, that Dr. Firm is running. Uh, because, Dad, when you and I are seeing patients, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, there's only so much information you can give them about nutrition and diet. I mean, right. then they need to go home and make those changes. But if you're actually at a retreat center, you're there with other people that you can relate to. And then you have all the support systems and network in place where you can really learn how to, like, cook good food and actually, like, what good food tastes like. So, Dr. Furman, I want to hear more about this, this health center you have. First off, you know, how did you create this thing? And secondly, what's going on there? Thanks, Drew. Well, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's fun for me, you know, because I love doing this stuff. But, you know, I've been in practice out of the office seeing patients for like 30 years. And like you're saying is right. You give it your all to try to motivate, encourage, teach. And then some people listen to you and some people don't because food right. addiction is so powerful. And their negative home environment and the naysayers and they try to they don't fit in with their family and their friends are saying, what are you doing that for? You know, but in other words, it's it be, with all my work, it's always a disappointment when people, you know, are sick and, you know, they could have gotten well and they just didn't do what you wanted them to do when they and something bad happened. So I knew that there was a need for a place where people with food addiction and trouble applying this information could come and stay there for a while. And it's like drug rehab. You can't just go for a week or two. You go for a week or two, you still, your taste buds haven't changed. You haven't learned enough. You haven't, because people get a personality change and they learn the psychological and reasons they emotionally overeat. And it takes time for them to retrain their taste, learn the information. And also they, we give them so much training on food addiction counseling, but like a drug addiction center with cocaine addicts, you have less recidivism when people are off the cocaine for three months. And nothing works as effective as abstinence. When you have these sugar addicts or the fried food addicts, they're, you know, they're salt addicts, they can't just tell them to cut out sugar. They're just struggling. But once you, they're in a place or cut off smoking even or stop drinking alcohol, but the point is once you're away from those foods for a few months, there are a hold on you lessons yeah. and, you, and you don't crave them anymore. And then you can enjoy the natural flavor in a strawberry or a piece of lettuce or a carrot or something because it, your taste buds now get stronger too. So yes, I'm saying that um, it gives me the ability to uh, um, increase the probability and almost assure a person is going to be able to take what they learn and apply it in their home when they leave and continue to live this way to, um, and pro make progress progression as opposed to they go away to these healthy retreats or healthy health um, centers or you know, and they live there a week or two and they lose weight and they eat really healthy and they're living on sprouts and they go home and they can't sustain it and they go back to eating their old way and they gain the weight back. So what good was that? They wasted their money. So we're trying, So I wanted to really set up a place where I could kind of assure that people would learn this and adapt to it and be indoctrinated in it so well that when they go home, they have the skills and the ability to stay with it long term. Like, for example, I had a girl who was uh, 19 years old who came in who was 380 pounds. Ooh. And she and she didn't want to be here. Her parents forced her to be here. Mm. She was giving me, you know, argument that she's never going to eat this way. What is she wasting her time here? And I said, well, you can go home now. This is not, a, you know, if you don't. But she stayed um, three and a half months and she and she went below 300 pounds. She lost 80 pounds in three and a half months. But she became so nice. Or she was so grateful to be there. Her personality changed. Her whole purpose in life changed. It was great. We went on hikes with her and she really became a different person. She went home and she lost another hundred pounds since she's been home and she looks great now. And she just is so excited about her life now. And I, like, like 
So I see a lot of people. So you feel good about that. You know that you could yeah. have impacted her if she just stayed a few weeks. She, she needed to be here a few months, you know, to have to be have a, a long term effect in her life. And yeah. I just want to tell you one more quick. Yeah. Case. I had this mayor come from an East Coast city and his creatinine was 2.5 or 2.6. So he was out of control diabetes and his blood pressure when he arrived was like 240 over 120. And he came straight from the hospital here because they couldn't control his blood pressure in the hospital. And he was on six different blood pressure medications and his blood pressure was still out of control. So of course, we didn't just control his blood pressure in the first week, but by the time of the second week, he was off all blood pressure medications with a normal blood pressure. And his diabetes went away, so we didn't require any medications. So when he, he only could stay eight, eight weeks. So at the end of the eight-week stay, I repeated his creatinine, and everything got better except his creatinine. His kidney function was only down to 2.4. So he still got rid of his diabetes. He got rid of his blood pressure, no medications. He dropped about... 35 pounds. And he, but he was so excited about this. He called me uncle Joel. He became very, very excited about living this way. He went home, he lost another 30 pounds and repeated his creatinine two months later after he left here and his creatinine of course went back to normal again. And that's hard. That's that's incredible. That's a great story. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and Dr. Herman, walk us through the daily routine of one of these uh, these patients that come to the center. I mean, what happens when they wake up? What do they have for breakfast? What kind of education do they have before lunch? Like, just walk us through kind of what the whole daily program is all about. Sure, it, it might change day to day. Yeah. But, um, they wake up and they they usually go for a walk before breakfast. And we have hiking trails and we have a th- we're next to a thousand acre park with miles of trails up and down, according to their ability, of course. We have some great trails. And then they come back. So they go for a walk in the morning. They come back and eat breakfast um, every other day. It depends on the person, but they sometimes have a small glass of vegetable juice with, with vegetables in it. And then they have a, with um, flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, a little bit of um, a plant milk with some kind of um, berries and berries like um, blackberries and wild blueberries and, and um, guava or passion fruit, some kind of fruit and berry and nut mix. And then they, and then they, so they have a, a light breakfast. Sometimes they have a little oats mixed in there, but mostly it's, or, um, but mostly it's berries and, and nuts and seeds and stuff like that. And then they, then they have lunch for lunch is a large salad with a dressing made of nuts and seeds and maybe, you know, tomato sauce or some kind of healthy dressing, not with no oil, no salt. But they have, of course, in it, arugula and bok choy and scallion and onion and mushrooms and cooked mushrooms in there and, and maybe some um, chickpeas or whatever it is they're putting on top, sliced tomatoes. They have a nice salad, not in a six inch bowl, a soup bowl, but a full, you know, large bowl like you would serve a serving bowl, like nine inch serving mm-hmm. bowl salad. And then they have a bowl of vegetable and bean soup, and that might have mushrooms and onions in it and things. So, but and a piece of fruit for dessert. And then they so between breakfast and lunch, they usually either have a, an exercise class or a or a meeting on food addiction or a lecture or some kind of um, group talking about um, group meeting on um, you know. Cook. So there's some kind of usually meeting in the morning, and then after lunch they either have a cooking class, an exercise class, or a water aerobics class. On, or they're going to the gym and they're doing some exercise other than walking. And we have a sand volleyball court, mm-hmm. uh, which we don't just use for volleyball. I want them to do lateral motions on the sand, whether we're teaching them um, how to move, how to shift and, and skip laterally, stop and move back the other direction and do sidestepping back to center and to walk and move and back and forth on sand because we're teaching them because a lot of people get older and they, they don't fall forward and backwards. They fall to the side, fracture a hip. They have a, and, and being able to be coordinated to move lap rapidly and push back to center and develop more shapely. So we use a lot of exercising where they're doing lateral motions back and um, side to side. And of course, a whole body exercise. We also have a um, power plate machine, a, 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 uh, mm-hmm. one of the ones professional football and baseball teams use where they can do some exercises on the vibrating machine. And we have a, you know, a full gym too. So they're doing some kind of other exercise, even if it's just what they can handle for a short period of time. And then, then they have the pool is open all, we have the pool heated to 86 degrees. So they have a nice warm pool all year round, saltwater pool. Where they can swim and do what well, either swim or do exercises in the pool. And then they have dinner early at five o'clock. And the dinner consists of some raw vegetables, solid vegetables with a with a healthy dip, like a hummus dip or a or a um, or a salsa dip 
with um, you know, raw jicama uh, or uh, bok choy or carrots and peppers and, and cherry tomatoes. They might have raw vegetables. And then they have a cooked vegetable dish with a delicious sauce, like a Thai sauce or, a, or maybe on a bed of um, spaghetti squash or some kind of um, vegetable entree. And then a small dessert or frozen fruit dessert. And that marks the end of eating for the day where they're then um, going to, they're not eating after six o'clock except for water or a glass of tea or something. Mm -hmm. We're trying to have them have four hours of no food coming in before they go to bed at night. So that's a basic schedule there. And I'm let, and I, so between my lectures and the counselors and the food addiction lectures and the exercise and the, and then they have free time. A lot of them on the internet work still connected with their jobs or mm -hmm. still, you know, and the evenings are kind of left free for them to do, um, to watch a movie or do something like that, you know. That's great. And so are, is this 100% plant-based? Is there any, any animal products that are used? No, at the retreat, it's 100% plant-based. Got it. Got because, it. you know, it's, it's a lot of different reasons why. Because people are asking me, you know, they're asking me all the time, you know, do you ever have oil on your food? Are you ever pouring oil? Are you ever eating an animal product? Are you ever having anything off the diet? And I'm saying, well, I'm not a food addict. And I could have something off the diet and go right back to eating healthy the next day. But for food addicts, especially some of the people we see here, even going off the diet a little bit can trigger their desire to have more of those foods and to overdo it and to completely blow up. And they need, a, they need this period of abstinence to develop the taste and to develop the, the skills to make these foods taste great. Mm -hmm. so make, so, and you wouldn't be so amazed how my, we have four chefs and you would be amazed how great the food tastes. And we teach them how to make the food taste so much so fantastic with the type of recipes and dressings and things that we're making here. Um, so they get skilled. So this, the, um, our guests get skilled in making, being able to replicate the dishes they like and things like that, too. Got it. Got it. Well, you know, Drew, these people are getting so many live enzymes, you yes. know, these live foods that it just makes a lot of sense. And Dr. Furman, I really like the idea of all the exercise you bring into that. I mean, you're a world class skater. I mean, you're a, you're an ex jock. You you know how to bring in the discipline. And I think that discipline that these people go through in your program. I mean, I, I can just envision it. I mean, not not going through it myself, but I can envision that the way you structure it, uh, you know, with the classes, the exercise, uh, the gym, the swimming, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's a perfect environment. Just a perfect environment. Yeah, you know what's fun too is I grow a lot of the own food. I put in like exotic, hundred exotic fruit trees, and I have the vegetable gardens and beds, and I have special soil where it's so so fertile. You plant the seed, and like it's wow, this beautiful, gorgeous bok choy burst up into two weeks. It's so it's so it's so beautiful taking the food right off the land, and I I love it for me the the emotional. I like working with people. It still keeps my foot my my um hand in the, the in the my career i'm not without having to work as hard as i used to work i'm a little bit you know i cut down the amount of hours i'm working but i still can do the type of work with patients i enjoy but also i can spend more time gardening and and you know put, taking care of my fruit trees and and actually make living off the land so to speak and i'm curious how how do you guys manage the withdrawal effects that some of these people may have to sugar, to salt. I mean, and, and maybe describe what some of these withdrawal effects might look like. That's a good question. Um, and it's the, the withdrawal effects are most uncomfortable the first three to four days. Mm -hmm. By day five or day six, the people are pretty much fine. It's rare that it continues more than a week. Um, and salt, um, when you're on a high salt diet and they go to such a low salt diet, because when you're on a high salt diet, the kidney gets good at excreting all the extra salt. And the problem is it loses a lot of other minerals in the process. And you lose minerals and salt through your sweat too. Mm -hmm. But when you accommodate long term to a low salt diet, you stop excreting extra minerals and salt in your kidney. And your sweat doesn't secrete much salt. So you can run and sweat and play tennis and jog and not really going to not get cramping or electrolyte deficient. But in that short period of time in the first two weeks, when people are switching from a high salt diet, to a low salt diet, their kidney is still excreting a lot of salt. It hasn't curtailed that yet. It takes time to curtail that. And they temporarily could have a dip in sodium in their bloodstream and starting their blood pressure could get, a little, could get too low and they could feel fatigue. So they could have enhanced fatigue in the first week or two accompanied by, but the first few days they could be headachy and feel a little bit uncomfortable and agitated and, and mostly, um, you know, and mostly if they're on a lot of caffeine, 
they could be withdrawing from their caffeine too, which takes a couple of days to get to feel better for them. We don't want people, you know, occasional a little bit of caffeine and tea or something is, is okay, but the, we don't want people exposed to a lot of caffeine because the withdrawal from caffeine makes people want to eat more yeah. food because they use food as a means of negating the withdrawal from the caffeine. So we don't want them to confuse the two. And we want them in to get in touch with true hunger, what it feels like to be hungry. So they can start to use hunger as a gauge as to how much calories to eat, to only eat when they're hungry and don't recreational eat when they're not hungry. And if they're withdrawing and they're eating to, to curtail the agitation, the stomach cramping, the headache and the weakness from detoxification from your bad diet, then they're eating, then I call that detox hunger or toxic hunger, then they're always, they have to continually eat all the time because they don't feel well. So we got to get them not to, um, no longer dependent on food for, for maintaining their level of energy. Because food isn't there, because this is a whole misnomer that people, the whole myth is that people think they have to eat to keep their energy up. And they don't, you feel fine. You don't need food for energy. You can live off your fat cells. You're not going to, you need, you feel weak if you're toxic and you're detoxifying and you're not digesting food and you feel fatigued. And people got to, so they constantly overeating because they feel wiped if they don't keep overeating calories. And we get rid of that the first week. And then over time, they really feel hunger in their upper part of their lower part of their neck and upper part of their chest, in their neck and throat area. And they can start to differentiate the withdrawal symptoms from what real hunger feels like. And I know this, this will probably change based on who's coming in, their weight, sex, et cetera. But generally speaking, what type of calorie count per day are, are people aiming for at the center? That's exactly. We may have a person who's an athlete coming in. You have a rheumatoid arthritis or a big person coming in who's not overweight, let's say, and they may need more calories. But generally, most of the overweight people who are food addicts, and that's the majority of our patients, are women who are overweight who have food addiction. That's the majority. And so most of them were shooting between 1,200 and 1,400 calories a day between 12 and 400. And that's a lot of food when you're eating a lot of, um, when you're eating a lot so much vegetables and mushrooms and onions yeah. and all kinds of dishes, that still could be a lot of very filling, a lot of food for them. And they might even have to moderate that to keep, make sure they're losing a pound every three days. Cause we want people to, and most of the people don't, most of the people losing 20 to 30 pounds the first month, by the way, they're losing more than a kilogram a week. Mm -hmm. But even the people that are relatively slow weight losers, and have more difficulty keeping it up, which we're monitoring them to make sure they're dropping approximately a pound every three days to keep them on track. And, and you know, it's, what's funny is that people say you can't age backwards. You can only slow the aging process. But that's not true. You can age backwards because we can do telomere tests and we can do all kinds of – and we see that, they're, that these things, after three months of eating so healthfully – their telomeres show they're 10 or 20 years younger. You know what I mean? I mean, you can see the way they look and they feel in their skin and they're, they just are, they're actually, um, and have an, and it has an anti-aging effects. Hey, Joel, I'm curious, um, what percentage of fat is in a diet? The, 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 I mean, all, you're giving them all fresh fruits and vegetables and some soups, et cetera, et cetera, but have you ever, you know, figured out like, how many carbs are in a diet, you know, grams of protein, carbs and fats, et cetera? It, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Because believe it or not, one of the most striking findings in the last decade in the history of nutritional science has been like the Adventist Health Study 2 that has 17 other studies corroborating the fact, the fact that more nuts and seeds in the diet and more, and more of the fat from nuts and seeds lead to a 39% reduction of cardiovascular death. Right. Points. And that's been reproduced in study oh, after yeah. study. And that these low fat diets and cutting out all the fat is, going to, is more um, likely to promote irregular heartbeats. And we know that in the physician's health study, you had a 60% reduction in sudden cardiac death in people eating nuts, an ounce of nuts and seeds on daily. So, and the fifth quintile, the highest quintile of the seven day Adventist study compared to the first quintile, showed the most beneficial effects on longevity. And they were eating about a, um, more than 1.4 ounces per day of nuts and seeds. So we strive for about a half an ounce of nuts and seeds with each meal. So people are eating, a, even, even my overweight patients are getting an ounce and a half of nuts and seeds a day. And, and me, for example, doing more exercise and more, so I'm eating more like three ounces a day of nuts and seeds, but my patients are probably eating it here, 
are probably, unless there's a teenager here or some person who's not overweight, just enjoying the food, they can have more. But most of the people who are overweight are getting an ounce and a half because that's what the Seventh-day Adventist study, Adventist Health Study 2, showed were the most positive effects. And that was in all cohorts, men, women, old, young, Caucasian, uh, uh, Asian, whatever it was, um, vegan, non-vegan. It, so it, it held through all cohorts that the inclusion of nuts and seeds, are particularly, and especially walnuts and so we're giving them some degree of fat. They're right. having, their diet is not one of these super low fat diets. Like I don't strive for 10% of cat fat or low. They're probably getting more like 20% of calories and fat. Oh, I love it. I mean, you're singing to the choir as a heart specialist. I, I mean, I believe in a, I mean, I, I think the high carbohydrate diet is, is, is really the most inflammatory diet. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts about the pre-med study because the pre-med study, uh, you know, looked at, uh, you know, nuts and seeds and, um, no, it's a third of those people got nuts and seeds and a third got four tablespoons of olive oil a day. And then the other group got the American Heart Association diet. Right. Exactly. Heart stroke, cancer, heart disease went way down in the people getting the higher fat diet as well. That's right. And the, and the nut and seed diet got even more protective effects than the olive oil did. Yes, so, slightly more protective. You're correct. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Is if it, so most nutritional scientists agree that. Um, walnuts are better than walnut oil, and sesame seeds are better than right. sesame oil, and mm -hmm. almonds are better than almond oil. So getting the, so that's the unique part of the nutritarian diet is making sauces and recipes. Instead of the oil, we use the whole nut or seed to make these sauces and dressings that really taste great. And and say so we're really switching. And oil is more fattening. Even you know, I, oil it doesn't trigger the apostat receptors in the hypothalamus like the nuts and seeds do. And all the calories in nuts and seeds are not biologically accessible because the sterols and the stanols attract fat and pull some of that fat into the toilet bowl. So it so it gives you the signals you ate all those calories, but then eventually they don't all biologically enter the bloodstream. So what I'm saying right now is that oil promotes increases your desire for more calories as an appetite stimular, stimulant. And nuts and seeds do the opposite. The consumers have got very opposite effects. So we switch the fat from oil to whole foods, including, you know, low sodium olives and a little avocado dip and yeah. stuff like that. So we do use um, those kind of fat, healthy fats in the diet and get remarkable results doing so. Now, and the other second finding that's so important is it showed that that all plant-based diets didn't have were complete were very different in that that adding more protein in the form of plant protein like soybean, hemp seeds, Mediterranean pine nuts, broccoli florets, we're talking here about that more plant protein enhanced longevity, whereas more animal protein decreased longevity. And it showed that the lower cat protein, lower fat plant diets, like fruitarian diets, macrobiotic diets, high carb potato-based plant diets, do not have the same um, beneficial effects on longevity as a diet that pays more attention to protein with beans and nuts and greens and other high protein plant foods. So once you move plant based like this, then paying a, paying attention to the higher protein plant foods do have an ex a beneficial effect. How, how do you and, feel about lentils and uh, and chickpeas, for example, uh, in a diet? Yes, I, I love lentils and chickpeas, but lentils are an incredible food because they're and that, that's an important part of the diet. Yeah. Because you don't get the insulin response as well with, with lentils. That's right. When you have the, these um, beans are very high in resistant starch and slowly digestible carbohydrates. The slow digestible starches, the resistant starch promote the growth of good bacteria that create a biofilm over the villi mm -hmm. that now slow the glaze. Call, the scientists call that the second meal effect which means when you have a mango or something you ate at a follow-up meal, the glycemic effect of the mango is lowered because you ate the beans and the lentils, which right. caused the coating to occur on the villi, which slows the glycemic effect of other foods at a follow-up meal. But what I'm saying right now is, yes, it's not just that the, um, they have slow digestible starches, but the resistant starches make all their calories not biologically accessible because the resistant starches are converted by bacteria into short-chain fatty acids particularly butyrate, right. and butyrate has not only anti-inflammatory effects, but it has a negative feedback loop on the apostat in the hypothalamus and makes you want to eat less calories. So because the calories from lentils and most beans only enter the bloodstream at one or two calories a minute, you don't have a spike in insulin like, like you would have if you ate potatoes or rice. Right. Well and, said. And uh, you know, Dr. Furman, I wanted to circle back to the nuts and seeds really quickly because I feel like there's a lot of misinformation out there around how you should buy them, how you should store them. Do you recommend that people buy them in the refrigerated section of like a health food store? I mean, how do people go about doing this to prevent rancidity? 
Well, when they, you know, we want all food, you know, to be fresh if possible. You're yeah. right. If you're buying them in bulk and not going to eat them right away, they should then store them in the refrigerator or the freezer. Nuts and seeds store well in the freezer too. And a lot of people have freezer space to spare, you know, okay. and we recommend you um, grind the flax seeds and then either utilize that, use them or store them in the freezer because they'll actually keep better in the freezer once they're ground. Well, dad, do you have any other questions at all? About, uh, no, I, I think this has been phenomenal. I mean, this is, uh, so, this is, this so is awesome phenomenal. stuff. This is this is leading edge, cutting edge stuff. And I, and Dr. Furman, I mean, it's been a pleasure just to you know, be on this podcast with you. Oh, thanks so much. Well, thanks. So as a heart specialist, you're singing to the choir. I mean, yeah. that's, that's unbelievable. Good to know you guys, and we got to keep in touch. You know. Yeah. Well, I, I got to say, I mean, this this is where my heart is with having like a retreat center. I I, I think this is really the, the the wave of the future in terms of medicine because. Again, it's so hard to really get information across and have patients learn. You have to come out and visit us sometime. I think I'm going to come out. I'm. I'm, I'm Where do you live, out. by the way? Where do well, you? Well, I'm, I'm in the Bay Area, so I can certainly come oh, down. Okay. I'd love to. You know, my daughter's in naturopathic school. I have a 29 year old daughter in naturopathic school. Oh, really? Interesting. I, I could talk to her sometime. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, oh, sure. wow. Well, cool. hey, before we before we wrap up today, as always, we're going to share some wellness wellness wisdom with our listeners. Um, so what is your number one top nutritarian tip that you can, you know, give our listeners in terms of achieving good health in one to two weeks? The most important tip is the make salad, the main dish, at least one meal a day, have a giant salad as your main dish. And we usually make that lunch. So it's usually I'm saying lunch is very, is the most important meal a day. And it always should be salad, a big salad, a bowl of soup, and a piece of fruit for dessert. Salad, mm. soup, dessert for your lunch. And if the whole country and world did that, we'd have an amazing better health across the world. The <laughs> yes. And then, well, Drew, I want to ask Dr. Furman a question. Yeah, Joel, if you were to pick your top three superfoods, what would they be? Um, well, a green cruciferous, of course, um, because, and, and I, you know, I love bok choy because I grow it. And it doesn't yeah. get bugs on it, like aphids and slugs, and it grows. It's so hard to blow it, you know. So, so I think um, bok choy would be a probably one of my favorite and, foods. And so versatile. Like the second choice, or yeah, you, you know, ca you know, kale, collards, you know, all kinds of things are are, are good cruciferous. But yeah. um, but the bok choy is um, you could juice it, you could steam it, you could eat it raw, you could do so many, you could cook it, you could put it in a wok, you could do so many things with it. Um, and then of course, um, shiitake mushrooms. Because you can use it, it has like a meaty, chewy feel. You mm -hmm. can mix other mushrooms with it, but you could always have shiitake in your soup. And you know, shiitake mushrooms are a major thing. And then, I, then believe it or not, scallions. Scallions have incredibly powerful anti-cancer effects. That people and I'm and raw scallions on your salad are so um, great. And you could put it, you could sprinkle raw salads on your cooked vegetable dishes. You could put raw scallions to flavor and mix it into your cooked vegetables. It would drizzle on top of your soups. It's a great food and a very powerful. Um, extra anti-cancer nutrients in there. The yeah, and they get quercetin in the, in the scallions as well. And quercetin is just incredible right now in a COVID-19 age as well. So right. and it, has, it has on the organos, like MSM, the organosulfite compounds, there's so many beneficial effects shown to have anti-cancer ability. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Well, Dr. Herman, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I, I, I learned a lot and I, I know our listeners did as well. Oh, my pleasure. All right, good talking to you guys. All right, best of Thank you, Joel. That was great. Thank, Thank you. So much. That's our show for today, folks. If you have a question or an idea for a show topic, please send us an email or share a post with us on Facebook. And remember, if you like what you heard today and you want to be an active member of the Be Healthistic community, subscribe to our podcast at BeHealthisticPodcast.com or on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your favorites. You can also find more great content and information from us and the Healthy Directions team at HealthyDirections.com. I'm Dr. Drew Sinatra. And I'm Dr. Steve Sinatra. And this is Be Healthistic. Thanks for listening to Be Healthistic, powered by our friends at Healthy Directions with Drs. Drew and Steve Sinatra. See you next time.